Okay, I think we can uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, so I'm Samantha, I'm the PXC Marketing Coordinator, and we are so pleased to have Jonathan and Stephanie here to give their uh, discussion on biomineralization and how it affects our bones. And uh, if you guys wanna introduce yourselves and then we'll just get started. Great. Well, thanks for uh, joining us on this Thursday night. Um, we're going to have a fun time tonight running through uh, the first of two parts of a talk that we wanna share with everybody. And the first part of it is the delight of biomineralization. Um, through this one, I would love to go through the real basics of how bone is made. And then in the next webinar of this series, we're gonna switch over to the villainy of biomineralization and talk about how uh, these properties that we're going to go through today are hijacked by tissues outside of bone leading to problems such as what we see in PXE. So one of the first things that we'd love to do is just to thank the James O'Loughlin uh, Research Fund. It has been absolutely wonderful for us uh, here at Vanderbilt working in um, bone biology as well as is working on exactly why PXE happens and what we can do to try to prevent it and to fix it. So starting off, um, I am an orthopedic surgeon. Um, and this first part is just an aspect about how my whole entire life is focused on ossification. So orthopedics um, actually means straight child. And so for the most part, my job is, is to make absolutely certain that going from here to here is, is that all of your joints are aligned absolutely perfectly so that you can degenerate very gracefully. And so this process requires uh, that we make sure that ossification occurs exactly at the right time and that your skeleton and limbs all grow to the same length. And it's a principle that I get to use and I have a delightful uh, job working with children, making absolutely certain that their limbs are straight. And if they have a problem such as this, like a fracture, is, is that we get everything lined up and that process of ossification takes over from our hardware and heals so the child can return back to their normal life. On the flip side of that with ossification, we also work in conditions in which ossification is absolutely terrible, in which it's very similar to what we see in patients with PXE just at a much more extreme, such as this boy whose muscles in the front of his hip turned into bone inappropriately, making it so all he can do is sit in this position. So with these patients, I spend most of my clinic and my operative time working in ossification and trying to make absolutely certain that we optimize it where we need it, but make sure it doesn't happen where we don't need it. So this is the aspect of the setup for these talks is, is that this one we're gonna go through is as to how bone is made in the way that we would like it. And the next webinar, we're gonna talk about how bone is made where we don't want it. So as a definition, ossification is where we take inor inorganic mineral and we turn it into bone. And this is a process that is, again, very important to make sure that it happens where we want it and prevent it in all the soft tissues where we don't. So the main focus of my research lab is on how ossification is directed to bone and how ossification is prevented in soft tissues. Now, one of the most important take home points of all of this, especially once we get into uh, the villainy of bone is, is to realize that ossification is not a random process. It used to be thought that the development of beautiful bone like this just came from having lots of calcium and phosphate and they would spontaneously develop mineral. It is not that, it's not random and it is directed by cells. So the rest of this talk, we're gonna go through exactly how cells work to make beautiful bone structure like this. So from a very broad uh, view of mineralization, we have natural mineralization that is a naturally occurring process in which we have formation of an inorganic solid and naturally occurring substance that has a definite chemical formula with a crystalline structure. And we take it for granted, but this process obviously is essential for 
our planet, our lives, et cetera. And that process typically requires tons of pressure, lots of heat, lots of time. And in regards to the human timeline, this is incredibly inefficient. With that, in order to get over this inefficiency, we have figured out ways to make mineral. And so from the times of uh, ancient Greeks and Romans, um, we found more efficient ways of speeding up this process and have come up with in the last century, therefore incredible things such as these amazing machines into computers. And now we have the ability to actually print mineral um, and this has uh, led to some of the most incredible um, innovations of the next century. But one of the most important things to remember about this is so far at this point, one of the limitations of synthetic mineralization is, is that it cannot repair. And that's where we switch over to one of the coolest aspects of uh, what's happened in nature in regards to mineralization, and that is biomineralization. And biomineralization we have in terms of our skeletons, but also shells. And one of the most important things to understand about biomineralization is it's very timely, very efficient, and it can repair. And so this process combines calcium and phosphate into a crystal structure called hydroxyapatite. And that is the main crystal that forms our bones. The concentration or the ingredients of the concentration of the ingredients that make up that crystal being calcium and phosphate circulated an extremely high level outside of our bones and our blood vessels and they're combined purposefully by cells to make bone. They also though circulate in incredibly high amounts surrounding muscle and we have mechanisms by those cells that prevent them from making bone in muscle. And those are gonna be the parts that we really dive into what we think the molecular mechanisms of our PXC uh, that end up leading to hydroxyapatite formation in muscles. So the best way to think about it is, is that in normal conditions, we have very tight regulation that makes it so that we have mineralization in the skeleton, but don't have it in muscle. And as we age, we lose that regulation and we stop being able to make bone as well as we would like, leading to degenerative processes such as you see here. And simultaneously, we start to gain the ability to have mineralization in soft tissues. And that leads to problems such as like what you see here with cardiovascular calcification or disease processes such as heterotopic ossification. Um, and again, the main factors that lead to the loss of this regulation are problems such as age, big injuries, and in the cases, as we'll talk in the next talk about this, is where the PXC gene plays a role in soft tissues. So let's switch over to how biomineralization occurs and go through the cellular aspects as to how bone is formed. And to do this, we're going to talk about what I truly believe is, is the coolest machine that has ever been built, and that is called the physis or the growth plate. So this is a picture of the growth plate, and I hope after about five to 10 minutes going through this, you'll understand what all these cells are doing in here. And in particular, we have our bone forming cells called osteoblasts. We have our vascular cells called endothelial cells. And then we have our initial bone forming cells called chondrocytes. So these three cells are what makes up essentially the same thing as what we see here, which is that printer, and it essentially prints out new bone. So we're gonna quick go through how this is formed. So physis is the ancient Greek word for nature, origin, or birth. And it is at the ends of bones in children. And if we zoom in on this area and we look at it in terms of the blood supply, one of the most important things to realize about the growth plate is that it has two different blood supplies. It has a blood supply that comes in at the top of the physis, which is called the epiphysis in this area, and a blood supply that comes in down here, which is called the metaphysis or right below the physis. So you have these two sets of blood vessels that work together to help feed the cells within the growth plate or the physis to make newly forming bone. 
And again, those cells are called chondrocytes, and these are the same cells that line your joint up here. And then you have your bone forming cells called osteoblasts. And so the blood vessels up here supply nutrients to these chondrocytes. And as you're about to see, these blood vessels in here mix with the bone to form new bone. So while you're growing, you don't have any blood vessels that cross over in this area. And that becomes very important in terms of what we're gonna see in terms of oxygen and how the loss of oxygen drives that bone printer to make new bone. When we're done growing, what ends up happening is, is that these blood vessels here start to invade into the physis and they connect to the other side. And once that happens, we no longer grow. So children and adults have a very different structure at the ends of their bones leading to their growth. So now let's zoom in to that bone printer and see exactly how it works. So again, we have the top of the bone called the epiphysis, and then we have the bottom of the bone that we call the metaphysis, and we have our chondrocytes that are in between here, and then at these ends, we have a blood vessel here, the bone forming cells that are right next to the blood vessel, and then at the top, we also have blood vessels that feed nutrients into the growth plate. It's very important to see that the blood vessels here mix in with these cells, they interact with them, whereas up top you have the separation up here that the blood vessels cannot get to these cells right here. And so the, one of the most important things to take away from this is to watch what happens in this area in terms of understanding what we think happens with PXC, is, is that these cells right here are basically starved of oxygen as we're about to talk to I talk about. And when that happens, it forces these cells to, to start taking calcium and phosphate and making little itty bitty crystals. And so for PXE, what we think happens is, is that there are genes that regulate the soft tissue cells such as muscle to make it so that when those cells are injured, they don't develop these little crystals. And in PXE, those cells end up losing their ability to protect against making these crystals. And that's going to be what we'll focus on in the next talk about this, is what happens in here in soft tissue cells. But in good mineralization, these cells right here are fantastic because they provide all the seed that's required for these osteoblasts to make this critical bone. So it's essential as to how these three cells work together. So if we go back to this and look in regard to our oxygen tension, is, is that the whole purpose of the growth plate is, is to create a scenario in which the amount of blood vessels that are in here drop way down and you get starved cells. And again, that starvation of oxygen causes these cells to start producing these crystals. So the chondrocytes live in relative hypoxia. They really don't have any oxygen in this area. And the osteoblasts down here hate hypoxia. They love to live right next to a blood vessel. And so when we have our bone rules that we go through this is, is that if these osteoblasts lose their blood vessels, they will die off. But what's wonderful about this is, is that the chondrocytes that live right in here absolutely don't mind hypoxia at all. They're an anomaly compared to all their cells and they actually stay alive. And as they drive deep into that area where they really lose their oxygen, they turn into what we call the bone bomb where they start to make little crystal. They release seed to bring in blood vessels. They release seed to bring in a, uh, a, a cytokine that will help grow bone and other factors that we end up seeing show up in soft tissue cells that have uh, the PXE mutation. So again, what we think happens in PXE is, is, is that with the mutations is, is it forces cells such as this to start to make the same type of material that these chondrocytes make. So this is the best bone graft because it promotes the development of vessels, develop the promotes the development of bone, and they stay alive until a new blood vessel follows the trail of this seed and comes in and touches those cells. 
when it touches those cells, it either turns this cell into an osteoblast or it dives into it and the osteoblasts come in and start making bone, such as you see here. And so the interaction of all of these cells are critical. And again, we think this is the molecular aspects that as we'll talk about in the next talk, lead to uh, problems with PXE. What's really cool about this is at night when the child offloads is, is that you get an expansion of the growth plate which drags these vessels along. And this is how we grow is just that if these replicates happen at night, those chondrocytes proliferate, dragging the blood vessels and the process just continues. So all of our growth is really just proliferation events of these cells, differentiation and, and the production of all of the crystal that you see here with growth factors to bring in new blood vessels to make new bone. And this controls our height. And we, we have problems with this in children with these cells in terms of genetics, we have genetic diseases, uh, such as you see here with achondroplasia. Whereas down here, if we have any problems of those blood vessels or the bone cells, is as we start having problems with the bone quality, such as what we see in diseases of rickets. So I spend most of my time looking at and diagnosing problems in this area, which makes it fun for us to really look into PXE, because again, we focus right in this area to look to see that soft tissue cells start becoming this when they shouldn't. So it's really cool in terms of how you developed and how your bones are all the same length is, is we have this process that bones are made through cartilage, which is like a clay or a Play-Doh mold. And as it molds, the process of vessels coming in and starting to interact with those chondrocytes starts to make bone. And then the blood vessels go towards the end of the bone and we develop our growth plate. Because the blood vessels can't go through the growth plate until we're done growing, we sprout blood vessels that go into the end of the bones, and then we grow. And then once we stop growing, all of these blood vessels will go across and connect with the other side, making the growth plate go away. It's amazing to think how well this happens and how all of your limbs are actually the same length. Now, if we take that, what nature has done that's really cool is it just repeats that growth plate in areas that we break a bone. So for example, when we look at biomineralization, that growth plate is so cool because it's timely and efficient. But what's so neat is, is that nature just repeats this entire process when it's injured, and that's how we get repair. So if we take a big bone like this, it has lots of blood vessels in it, and we have a big fracture, we have a big area where we lost our blood vessels. This is what we call hypoxia. And as the bones come together, they start releasing uh, lots of stem cells that start to grow. And if there's lots of motion there, those and there's not much oxygen, and that motion is called strain, is, is the stem cells will start to go and turn into chondrocytes, just like in that growth plate. And as the blood vessels come out of the bone going into that area, basically what ends up happening is we just form growth plates at the edges of where we have our broken bone. And with that, these chondrocytes right here will stabilize the fracture acting like a muscle, almost like the Incredible Hulk. And then at the edges, they turn into those bone bombs where they release all of the seed for blood vessels and bone. And again, we just have a growth plate and those cells grab onto these blood vessels and it just grows the bone back together. It's one of the most amazing processes. This occurs really in only about two to three weeks. And again, all this is doing is just repeating everything that occurred at the growth plate that made you the same length, but instead it was controlled here in that fracture. You get blood vessels then connect together and then all of the bone remodels back into that form. So this is how bone is made and it is really cool. And so when we go and look at how our biomineralization is really good, is, is that remember that this is a cell mediated process. It's not random. Is, is that we purposefully have chondrocytes that start to make nanohydroxyapatite. They make other seeds for bone to grow and then mixed with uh, endothelial cells, which are blood vessels and bone cells, 
They mix all of this together and produce bone, and it is awesome. The problem comes in when other cells that do everything they can to prevent things like this happen mutate or don't function correctly and start making that. And again, that's what happens in soft tissues is, is that this beautiful process that we focus bone formation in is hijacked. And that is what we will talk about next time in terms of how ossification is prevented in soft tissues, how muscle cells and skin cells work really hard to make it so that these guys cannot come together and form crystal, the exact opposite of what we went through here, and how mutations such as PXE can make it so that that process is disrupted, leading to crystal. And so that's where we lose our regulation. And again, that's what we will get into next time. So thank you very much for the time. This time we'll get into everything about the reverse of all of this. And I hope at this point you think that the coolest machine ever made was the physis. I wanna thank uh, especially Stephanie for helping out so much with all of this. We have so much fun investigating this and especially to the James O'Loughlin PXE Research Fund, which has allowed us to really dive deep into all of these models. So thank you. And if anybody has any questions, love to hear them. Thank you guys so much. Um, I'm gonna unmute our, our guests here. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, Pat, I know you mentioned you don't have a uh, mic, but feel free to feel free to pop your questions into the chat bar. Actually, it looks like I, I can't unmute you guys. So if you have a question, please uh, find the little microphone button on your screen and unmute yourself so you can ask. Looks like we've got a, a question from Pat in the, uh, in the chat bar. Oh, so in terms of the villainy component of bones, what tends to happen is, is we lose the ability to make bone, which leads to problems such as osteoporosis. Um, and the villainy component, again, that we'll, we've got great pictures for going into next time is, is that, that the muscle cells that we study, and then we also think that there are other uh, cells of the skin, for example, and then the muscle cells that line blood vessels, um, they use the um, ABCC6 gene to help regulate the formation of calcium and phosphate. And when that isn't working right, as we showed with those chondrocytes, is as they start to develop little crystals around them. Um, what's nice is it would appear we have a backup plan that we have these trash trucks, if you will, or macrophages that will come in and clear them out. But when those don't work, when the backup plan doesn't work, we'll start to accumulate crystal. Um, but we'll get into that a ton in the next one and show uh, everything fall apart. All right. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming, and then we'll see you guys in January.